Good morning, and I do appreciate the invitation, even if it's the uh, topic that no one else wants to talk about. Um, so I thought about getting up and just saying yes and sitting down and we'll go to break early. And then I said, no, I'll probably have to actually talk about this stuff. So um, those are a couple of my uh, things. I will talk about off-label use of several drugs. So the underlying assumption in this is, is chemotherapy is bad, novel agents are good, although we did hear about some of the toxicities this morning, and that if we get rid of chemo, we'll get at least equivalent, and in the case of ibrutinib, uh, probably much better outcomes. What is those outcomes that we're thinking about? And avoiding chemo will be less toxic, and as you also heard, there's maybe different toxicities, but less is a, not always better. So I love this one. I'm a lymphoma doc. I know this morning we heard about myeloma docs and lymphoma docs as if everyone's different, but you know, some of us see all heme malignancies. So, so this was, uh, you know, in the Cleveland paper when I was in Cleveland and, you know, the toxic drugs and the cancer, you know, in your bloodstream and the chemo going through and it's, it's all these sort of vicious sounding things. And there you go. Venomous liquid, I love that one. Um, but then remarkably, oops, she doesn't feel sick. She's fine. She's working. She's doing everything. And this is with CHOP, you know, so bendamustine, chopping. Chemo is not so bad for your patients a lot of times in terms of the acute toxicity. So that's a bad rep, um, but, you know, it's not always the worst thing. So when we think about trials, what are the endpoints? And obviously in CLL, the, the holy grail is to cure patients, so see a plateau on the survival curve. And we don't really do that at this point. Prolonged survival will be great, but we'd settle for a symptom-free interval, you know, off drug, off treatment, feeling well, doing your normal activities. But unfortunately, most of our trials talk about progression-free survival and minimal disease, which is really a surrogate for uh, progression-free survival. Uh, in most cases. And when you do compare strategies, it's important to really look at the details of the patient population, uh, what the, you know, age, comorbidities, et cetera, like that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about chlorambucil is not always chlorambucil, even though no one cares about that anymore. Uh, different anti-CD20s may be better or worse, but may have to do with dose and schedule, et cetera. Uh, outcomes I just mentioned, toxicity. Uh, and what are our options for subsequent treatment? So I really think we focus sometimes on the PFS when we really need to think about the overall strategy that we're going to keep this patient alive for the next 20 years and how do we do that. So you all know about uh, CLL being at least two diseases, mutated and unmutated. Um, and now we have all these other genetic abnormalities, T, uh, deletion 17P, P53 is the one we always focus on, but you know, Notch and some of these other ones. But what we forget about is that there may be many clones in a patient, even at the time of diagnosis and certainly by the time of relapse. And so we are treating the dominant clone, but we may actually be missing the uh, other clones which are growing uh, under the radar. And so we'll come back to that and some modeling things later. So if, is chemotherapy passe? Well, I think for deletion 17P, yep. I give that one to you, you can have it. Ibrutinib is far better than chemotherapy. Chemotherapy doesn't work very well in this disease, in, in this uh, setting. And, um, but that's a relatively small number of patients. And I will say that as of today, chemotherapy is still the choice for the young fit patient with mutated IGVH. Uh, and I'll show you that data. But again, that's a fairly small population. So those are the outliers and then we'll come back to uh, the rest of people. So is some CLL curable? Um, I'm not sure I believe that it's curable, but this is long-term data. The top is um, MD Anderson, the original 300 patients treated with uh, FCR. And it looks like the failure-free survival curve out at 10, 15 years looks like it may be a plateau. Certainly there are many patients who got six months of chemotherapy and more than a decade later are still in remission. And that tends to be the young fit patients who could tolerate FCR and who had the unmutated uh, disease, and then in the German CLLA trial, looking at that, it also looks like there's a plateau in that particular group of patients who got FCR with unmutated, uh, with mutated uh, uh, IVIG. 
So I think that is there. And then there's recent data that suggests the possibility that if you're MRD negative at three cycles of FCR, that might be adequate. So you could even reduce the toxicity further with less chemotherapy uh, being biologically targeted. <clears throat> So these are guidelines, there's uh, NCCN guidelines, there's a bunch out there, but these are the Hovon guidelines which were just published uh, earlier this year. So I figure they're up to date. And um, I think, uh, yeah, we're going to the pointer. But anyway, um, so on the left side, you see the deletion 17P. Yes, ibrutinib would be the treatment of choice um, in most patients, and maybe that'll be combination as we get later. Um, and then in the fit patient who does not have a deletion 17P, uh, they see FCR for the young fit patient and bendamustine rituximab if FCR is not an option. Again, I'll show you a little bit of data that might <clears throat> affect how you choose which of those. And then for the unfit patient, they're still looking at chlorambucil-based uh, regimens, although certainly ibrutinib in, in some uh, is certainly reasonable there uh, as a possibility. So here's the German CLL-10, FCR versus BR. And again, so this was reported as FCR is the winner in the young, healthy patient under the age of 65, based only on PFS. And again, FCR has toxicity, so you may not want to use it in everyone, and it may compromise treatment down the line. So just because you win in PFS doesn't mean you're the better regimen in the grand scheme of things. But for over 65 and comorbidities, the BR was just as good and certainly less toxic, and there's no survival benefit in either case. Um, so the germline IGVH at FCR uh, is the one that I think FCR, and then everything else you can argue. Um, and then we'll look at the right side of the graph, which is the unfit patient, sort of the chlorambucil. And what can you expect with chlorambucil-based therapy? They list obinutuzumab, rituximab, or ofatumumab. Uh, as uh, partners with the chlorambucil. And that's based on, on this study, the CLL11 study, which probably many people are familiar with. I've just, I haven't shown the chlorambucil alone. This is the obinutuzumab, otherwise known as Gaziva, so it's G-chlorambucil in the graph, or R-chlorambucil. Uh, remember that the obinutuzumab was given at higher dose more frequently, sort of a loading dose early, and I think that has a lot to do with the, uh, the benefit. Uh, but uh, you do get some MRD uh, in these patients, even with this relatively non-toxic uh, gentle therapy, uh, but not a lot of complete remissions. But you can see that you get about two years uh, disease-free on average. So what can we expect from these things when you talk to patients? So FCR, when you look through all the data, as I see it, you get you know, four to five years median time to progression. So you get six months of FCR, you get about four years or so uh, disease-free, off-treatment, just coming to the doctor every few months for checkup. Um, in the CLL-8, they actually included a small number of 17 Ps, relatively small number in the upfront, and they again got a little over four years. So I think that's a recurring theme uh, with FCR, although, as I said, the plateau in, in a subpopulation of patients. Um, so that's in, in all of these studies, um, you, you get a long uh, four and a half, five years. From BR, it's probably a little shorter in terms of PFS, maybe about three and a half years, um, both in, uh, and this is the data from the CLL-10 arm. Um, so just sort of a ballpark figure in your head about what you can expect. How about chlorambucil? And again, there's lots of things here, but I just want to focus that chlorambucil is not chlorambucil. So there's doses in, in the study, the first column, it's 10 milligrams per meter squared daily for seven days. That's 70 per meter squared over the month. And then some of the, in, in the other studies, you might get 0.5 day one, day 15, so much lower dose, much less often. And so, and when you look at the results, the progression free survival actually does seem to vary with chlorambucil dose. So we would never use another drug at such varied concentrations and doses and just lump it into, uh, you know, the, the category. So we really need to focus a little bit more on what chlorambucil dose, what uh, bendamustine dose, things like that, that we don't spend a lot of attention on because everyone's excited about the uh, novel agents. Uh, this is a study that just got published called Mabel. It's BR versus R chlorambucil in what was considered unfit patients. And again, I actually apologize, the median PFS is switched. The, the, FCR, the BR wins at 40 months. So again, even in this older population of patients, 
initial treatment, it's a sort of a muddy study and I'm not going to go into it, but basically you can get three and a half uh, years from bendamustine rituximab even in the older uh, patient with comorbidities. So this I took from the ASCO educational session, again, just a couple months ago. And again, you see I brutinib for the 17 Ps. Um, and for the, fit, uh, for the unfit patient, I brutinib or clarambucil plus anti-CD20. And then if you have IGVH unmutated uh, or deletion 11Q, they now say those are high risk, they should get ibrutinib, they don't do as well with chemotherapy. Um, I'm not sure I buy that totally. It's certainly a reasonable approach. But for the mutated, uh, IGVH mutated, then they talk about FCR or BR because the potential is for cure. So it gets sort of a complicated algorithm, but you can, you can see that there's still a significant role for chemotherapy in the current guidelines. Um, these are studies which I think uh, Dr. Bird mentioned will be at ASH and uh, I think will impact a lot of our approach looking at ibrutinib up front against FCR in the younger fit patient and bendamustine rituximab in the older patients. But I caution you that I expect that that will probably be uh, PFS data. And PFS, longer PFS doesn't always mean that's the best strategy. Uh, other strategies are using chemotherapy debulking and then to go to a, a, a novel agent. Uh, you don't need to look at all the details, but several months of bendamustine in the... Uh, this BXX study, and then followed by anti-CD20 and uh, ibrutinib or venetoclax or uh, PI3 kinase. And then the question is, can you get rid of the uh, debulking and just start with the regimens that you heard about already? Ibrutinib, venetoclax looks quite interesting, a lot of MRD uh, achieving, and then the hope, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Furman mentioned, of being able to stop therapy and get rid of this lifelong uh, goal of treatment, and certainly that would change the equation if we can treat patients for 18 months and have them off therapy for a significant time, then uh, we'll be much happier about starting with those agents. And then this is a study that's sort of under the radar that uh, Dr. Bird was uh, first author on, and a study that was a, an intergroup trial in the U.S. that came along right before all of the novel agents, and so it's sort of under the radar. But at the time, it was looking at FCR versus FR, uh, which hadn't been tested before. Uh, if you had high-risk cytogenetics, you switched over to the FCR arm and then got lenalidomide for six cycles, uh, six months, not with anti-CD20 and not forever, just six months of lenalidomide alone as a consolidation. And then if you, in the randomization, there was an FR, an observation, an FR plus lenalidomide. And again, complicated analysis, but what I want to point out is that uh, progression-free survival, the green line on top, that's FCR wins. But FR with six months of lenalidomide did, seem, did improve the PFS, so a brief consolidation period. And when you look at overall survival, the red line on the top, the winner, is actually FR with six months of lenalidomide. So how we use these agents, uh, not necessarily you start them and keep them forever, but how we use them really takes a lot of uh, learning, and we haven't even scratched the surface of these combinations, maybe debulking chemotherapy, and then an immune modulating agent and or some other novel agent would be a strategy that we, we shouldn't throw out at this point. So the question is, when is a good time to start novel agents? This I, slide I, I put together a couple years ago, and all the trials were BR plus ibrutinib, BR plus X. And the question was, you know, is BR plus ibrutinib better than BR? There's the SHINE trial, there's a number of trials in lymphoma. Uh, for those of us who do more than CLL, uh, some of us are smart enough to do more than one thing. So um, anyway, so you know, how do you decide that? And so we started uh, doing some mathematical modeling and I'm not going to spend a lot of time into this. We just published this in Leukemia Research earlier this year. But what you see is that um, what, what we modeled was a, a clone in red and then some very low-level clones, which we know exist at diagnosis. When you do high-throughput next-gen se sequencing, CLL, by the time we diagnose it, has multiple clones. And these clones come and go with time, and they come and go with treatment. So if you just, if everything's sensitive, then yes, BR plus ibrutinib will be better than BR alone in terms of PFS, and it'll look like you're really 
got that CR, MRD negative for years, but then a resistant clone will develop and grow back. And if that resistant clone is there at the start and is insensitive, say, to BR, that's the, uh, on, the B, on the B, but I'm going to show you that in more detail here in a second. So here we modeled um, starting ibrutinib at early relapse. So you, this was before ibrutinib was approved. You give bendamustine rituximab, you get it disease-free for a couple of years, and then you relapse, you start ibrutinib, clone goes away. But eventually, there's a chance you'll get a resistant clone, and then the disease will come back. And how you detect it, whether molecular MRD or just early clinical relapse, or you wait till the patient needs treatment, will depend on the time. Your endpoint will, depend on, will, will determine how much time you're disease-free. Um, so here we postulated that the clone would become resistant arbitrarily at two years on ibrutinib. And that's sort of BR followed by ibrutinib. If you do BR and start ibrutinib at the start, you end up basically at the same point five years down the line, but you've given ibrutinib for five years instead of three years. Now, it looks great. PFS is better, MRD is better, but you haven't in the long run helped the patient any better than starting ibrutinib at relapse. And in fact, if you wait a little bit longer, you might actually prolong the time. Now, this is all assuming that you get ibrutinib resistance. And, you know, some of the upfront studies that John showed earlier, uh, it looks like that's not a very high frequency. But again, we have to think about these things when we just throw these things out uh, and design studies. And then now we're at the point where we can actually do next-gen sequencing of patients serially, and you could imagine that you could detect a clone early on and say, I'm not starting ibrutinib now until that clone starts to go, and then I'll start it then. And then if a different clone comes up two years later, maybe I'll switch to venetoclax. So there might be smarter and better, although labor-intensive ways for us to use these agents serially. And I don't think we should toss that out uh, rather than just throw everything in at once. So um, how we put these things together is going to be key. And one of the keys is toxicity, and one of the keys is financial toxicity. Um, so, you know, these I took from a, a paper that was published in Blood Advances recently and, uh, you know, clearly shows ibrutinib is not cost effective. If you look at quality of life years, uh, starting it as initial treatment of older patients. And, you know, in our initial individual patient, we may not worry about that, but in the real world, we have to worry about that. Um, this is a curve taken from a paper in JCO. The, on the right, <laughs> you see the cost per patient of, uh, a cost to society of using novel agents uh, in treating CLL. That's the yellow curve as opposed to before. So the cost is going up astronomically, and we have to factor that in. And the more we use it, if we start it early, and uh, versus we, can we start it later, makes a huge difference uh, in, in societal costs. So I think immunochemotherapy is still quite reasonable. Very high response rates. I didn't show you, but in the MRD for BR, it's actually 40, 50 percent. We are very comfortable giving these things. There's durable responses of several years um, with, after a limited treatment duration. Uh, and you leave your options open for uh, novel agents later on, and I mentioned cost. So I think we have to think about not just PFS. When you look at the data at ASH coming out, what's the overall strategy we need to have? And so, you know, chemotherapy's in our toolbox and we shouldn't throw it away. Uh, we have to figure out the best way to combine uh, and when to use it, you know, even if it's second or third line after novel agents. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I am in 27 seconds early. Thank you. <laughs>